John grew up in Kenya and began his career there as a social studies teacher. In 1989, he came to Wyoming and began an educational path that ultimately took him to a PhD in 1998. Shortly thereafter, or probably already, and they finally put it into action, the College of Education uh, realized that they had a man of great talent and skills and quickly hired him into the education program at the University of Wyoming at Casper. So John is one of our Casper faculty. Um, he is, uh, Casper works very interestingly. Everybody who is stationed at Casper is actually part of the Laramie campus uh, and uh, works uh, quite intimately with the campus. Uh, in fact, John has been a very productive scholar. He's published over uh, 30 articles, book chapters, and so on. And over the last decade and a half, has pretty much settled into his position uh, as a teacher, as a researcher, as a community, somebody involved uh, with the community. And then about two years ago, when he thought he had it all figured out, um, the College of Education made him into a department chair. So John runs the Department of Educational Studies at the university from Casper. Uh, a job of uh, which I do not envy him, even though I, I have been uh, department head, at least I was on my own campus. Um, the chair, the Department of Educational Studies is a very important department, um, because from this position, John supervises the only department at UW that teaches every one of UW's aspiring kindergarten through 12th grade teachers. Uh, so very um, important department for, for what, what happens uh, in education here in the state. Um, children, you know, are our most valuable resource, whether the hour refu refers to our family, our community, or our nation. And teachers at all levels know that intimately. One of the most difficult things that a child learns as they grow up and go to school is that not everyone is the same. Not everyone is like them. The difference may be economic, maybe national, ethnic, uh, religious, or something else, but differences there are. And being able to handle those differences is part of what being an adult is all about. So how do teachers help their students learn about the difference? Well, that's one of the things that education professors explore, research, think about, try out, experiment, uh, and teach their students. Uh, this process goes by a variety of technical names, diversity, multiculturalism, social justice, globalization. But it's all about teaching students about human differences and the best way to live with them. Now, one of the best ways to live with them and to live with difference is to learn from it. After all, the billions of people in the world are all running pilot programs uh, for their approaches to the challenges and goals facing their society. Surely, among all those billions of people, some of those approaches are working well. Well, today, Professor Kambutu will explore one possibility of how we could learn from each other and the different ways that we do things uh, when he asks, and how are the children? An African approach to social integration. Professor Kambutu. Thank you, uh, thank you, Paul, for that. I like to use uh, mic uh, because of, uh, as you can tell, I speak English with an accent. And I do so because I grew up in Kenya, but I have been um, uh, in the US for about uh, 26 years. So, uh, but I still have the accent because I learned uh, the uh, uh, English language um, uh, in Kenya. And so right now, some of you might feel uncomfortable with the language because, or with the accent, because this is the first time for you, maybe some of you, this is the first time you have encountered this accent, and therefore the brain might be going, what's going on here, I don't like this, it might be wanting to shut down, whatever. I promise you, give me like uh, three minutes, just stay with me, and the brain has a way of doing wonders. Something will happen, and all of a sudden you're gonna be going, what accent, what is he talking about? <laughs> you're gonna be used to that. So, just wanted to uh, uh, share that with you. Uh, the, the other one, uh, just before I get into what I'm gonna be talking about, is something about myself. Um, you know, very quickly, I tend to be a weird person, and um, 
I did not give myself that uh, a description. Uh, one time I was uh, uh, talking to little ones, kindergartners, and uh, one of them, a little girl who was there, you know, she was looking at me in a funny way, and uh, knowing what I know about teaching, I asked her, what's, uh, what's going on? And uh, uh, she just said, you're weird. Uh, and, and so uh, I, I defined myself as the, um, uh, uh, the weird person. Actually, she was talking about uh, you speak English with an accent. But uh, children are not miniature adults. They don't uh, communicate the way we communicate. So really, she was talking about the accent thing. Well, one thing about weirdness is, um, and you're going to see it, I cannot uh, sit still. I cannot stand over here one place and talk. I have a hyper attention deficit disorder. I'm all of um, I'm all over the place, and and actually I kind of Paul. I want to complain about the setup here because it's gonna limit me. I like uh, being over there. I like being all over the place. Now I don't know what I'm gonna do other than coming to the side. So if you see me doing that, uh, please bear with me. The other thing is I can't wear a coat when I'm walking. I'm gonna throw it. Um, I'm gonna throw it away. Um, and I hope you're gonna be comfortable with that. So, so when, when Paul called me and, 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 and asked me to, um, uh, to do this, um, I began to process, I began to think about um, what is it that I'm going gonna, gonna to talk about. And um, I had several, um, several titles, uh, uh, several topics that, um, uh, uh, that came to me. And, and, and most of them had something to do with uh, education, uh, in fact, all of them had something to do with, uh, 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 with children. And, and the first topic that came to my mind, and, and, and by the way, just so you know, uh, if you see a preacher type kind of uh, behavior come about, I, I'm also a preacher, so uh, if I go crazy and I start screaming, that's, that's where it's coming from, <laughs> all right? Um, uh, if I say something, if I bring God into this, uh, into this conversation, uh, that's just who I am. So just bear with me. That's, uh, ju that's just who I am. So, so one piece that um, I, I talk about is called uh, peacemakers. Um, and, and so, well, one, one other thing I want to talk about, about myself before I get into this. So Paul says we're going to present. Um, I'm not a presenter. You know, I don't like to present. I like to talk with people. I like conversations, okay? And so this morning, uh, we're gonna be having a conversation. Sure, I'm gonna talk, I'm the presenter, I know that. I'm gonna present, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you questions. For example, the first question is, uh, so I wanted to talk about peacemakers. Who is a peacemaker? Sure, there's something happened in your brain when I mentioned that term, peacemakers. All of us are peacemakers. What makes us peacemakers? People who are trying to look for common ground. Beautiful. People who are looking out for the other. Peacemakers are people who sacrifice self for the sake of others. And so educators are peacemakers. All of us, whatever we do, we are peacemakers. We don't do it. We might think that we are doing it for ourselves, but we don't do it for ourselves. We do it for others. And therefore, as we do it for others, we are peacemakers. And I, and I wanted to talk a little bit about that, but uh, yeah, I, I decided, now nah, I'm not going to do that. I, uh, 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 because if I do that, then I'm going to be forced to talk about the opposite of peacemakers. So if peacemakers sacrifice self for the sake of others, what is the opposite of, of peacemakers? War makers, war mongers, or troublemakers. Okay? Who are troublemakers? Troublemakers are mean and cruel people. Oops. <laughs> Did you hear that one? Yeah, they are troublemakers. Cruel and mean people. Instead of causing peace, they wake up in the morning thinking about how they're going to cause trouble. And so I thought, OK, I'm not going to talk about peacemakers. How about uh, gracious peace? Eh, that's, that's a good one. Um, I, I'm going to talk about gracious peace. And that's not mine. I have borrowed it from, uh, and I can't remember her name now. But um, uh, Hughes talks about uh, 
a, a, a gracious face. What is a gracious face? Gracious, gracious. This is coming out of religion now, like grace. What is it? Gracious faith. Come on, people, you know this. <laughs> what is gracious faith? Oh, now I'm walking too much. I forgot I'm on camera. <laughs> All right, what is gracious faith? Comes out of grace. And then there's space. It's a sacred space. So our environment is sacred. When we are interacting with each other, we have to in have that mindset that we are in a sacred place. We have a purpose. There's a reason why we are here. And therefore, we have to think in a different way. Indeed, gracious space is a space where we invite the other. Inviting the other. Welcoming the other. The question is, who is the other? When you start examining that process of the other, you're going to see that the other is the other person who is different from you. And the opposite of a gracious face is a club. In a club, we have people who are like us. And therefore, if we are just associating, if we are just focused on people who look like us, then we don't have a gracious face. We have a club. I decided, eh. That's too contentious. I'm not going to talk about that. <laughs> and I said, how about it takes a village? <laughs> it takes a village. Oh, Hillary Clinton wrote a book on, uh, Hillary, on uh, it takes a village. She borrowed that idea from Africa, by the way. And, and, and then I thought, God, you're going to become political because of Hillary Clinton. So I said, nah, I'm not going to do that. All right. So uh, 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 the other one was, uh, how about... Um, how about international uh, experiences? I wanted to talk a little bit about international experiences, and I'm going to show you some pictures here. Because Wyoming has been, uh, um, uh, University of Wyoming College of Education, indeed my department has been uh, involved in a variety of uh, international programs, and, University of Wyoming, uh, and, and, and Wyoming has been uh, very much involved in a variety of ways in those uh, international programs. So I wanted to do that, but then I thought, uh, because we, we, we do fundraising, you know, to do the programs we do, I thought, today is not a day to ask for money. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I thought, all right, let's, let's not do international programs today. Let's do something else. So in speaking with Paul, we agreed on uh, this, uh, uh, and, and, and how are the children? Okay, so this morning we're going to be talking about, uh, and how are the children? And it's amazing how things work because um, I did not know that uh, uh, when uh, we agreed on this, maybe Paul knew it, but myself, I did not know that uh, uh, Caroline will be talking about Darwin and that I'm going to be the next person to talk about uh, uh, da uh, Darwin. Darwin, if you believe in um, uh, evolution theory, and by the way, I'm not a scientist. That's not my area. Don't start asking me questions about uh, evolution theory and whatnot. But if you stay with that theory, the survival for the fetus, the moving from uh, apes, you know, this and that, they talk about uh, 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 the whole process kind of starting from, uh, from Africa, East Africa. It, it, do I know what I'm talking about? Uh, uh, East Africa. The people he was referencing are the people we're going to talk about. It's just weird how things uh, are. Uh, so I'm just going to continue with that conversation knowing very well that uh, it's a hard art to follow uh, uh, what you just did, uh, what you just did, uh, uh, Caroline. So, so let's talk a little bit about this uh, Kisarian Ingera. It's a statement coming from the Maasai people. Um, and, and by interpretation, it means, and how are the children, okay? African is kind of uh, misreading, and I'm gonna go after you for a, uh, for a minute, um, uh, in a minute here. This is, I allowed uh, uh, Paul to put that word there because I knew I was going to go after people. The uh, Kisarian Ingera is not an African approach. It's a Maasai approach. Okay? I bring this up because uh, um, uh, my students, uh, um, you know, and, and other people, every time when they hear my accent, almost the next question is, uh, where are you from? <laughs> and I tell them, uh, I'm from Kenya. All right? Um, and I know I want to be negative a little bit. Americans, we are a little bit challenged when it comes to 
uh, uh, to geography. So, um, so I, I see Foggy uh, deer in the headlight look. And I say, uh, oh, oh, Africa, Mina, Kenya is in Africa. Oh, uh, do you know uh, so-and-so from, uh, and I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> Africa is not a country. Africa is a what? It's a continent. So that's why I start this presentation. I have to clarify, we're not discussing the whole of Africa. We are discussing just one country of 54 countries in Africa, just one country called Kenya. And in Kenya, we only focused on one ethnic group out of 42 ethnic groups in Kenya. And that ethnic group is called the Maasai. The preacher in me is coming out, isn't it? <laughs> I'm just, I'm warming up. What? You're going to see it. Yeah, <laughs> you can see it. So uh, I mentioned that uh, every summer, um, um, I don't know whether I mentioned it, but um, so every summer since uh, 2003, um, I've been taking uh, people, uh, students, people from Wyoming, who, whosoever we are, I've been taking them to Kenya for, I started off with uh, doing safari type deal, uh, cultural immersion, one not. And uh, from 2010, that program evolved into, now we do service running uh, projects in addition to uh, doing uh, um, uh, safari deals. And when we go on safari and cultural stuff, we always interact with the Maasai, okay? And is that a, it's, it was out of that interaction that I came across this Kisarian Ingera thing. We were speaking with the Maasai, so we keep going back and they, these days, you know, they keep talking, uh, Kisari and Ingera, what is it? We are talking with them. And lo and behold, I learned that, or we learned that, the Maasai have a special focus on children. Their lives revolves around children. They are so attached to their children such that they greet each other whenever they meet, whenever they wake up in the morning, their greetings are Kisarian Ingera. When two strangers meet, the way they greet each other is Kisarian Ingera. And how are the children? Their first conversation is about children. If children are doing well, if all is well with their children, then they can go on with whatever it is that they need to focus on. If the children are not well, if the children are sick, if the children are hungry, if the children, there's something going on with their children, everything stops. So they can address the needs that their children have. And so we're going to be talking about that piece, the Maasai focus on their children, and ask ourselves, do we have a similar mindset? And if we do, then how is it praying up? If we don't, could we maybe begin to think about, and yeah, when we look at the mass, I look at them, we might say, Darwin might say, hey, they're not there yet. They're still coming along in terms of civilization. But culturally, and their ways of life, is there something that we can borrow from them? We don't know yet. Maybe by the end of this uh, talk, we will, uh, we will uh, decide whether uh, we need to be rethinking the Maasai. So, there's my agenda. Who are the Maasai? I'm going to share with you some uh, data so I can put you to sleep. Oh, data, Ooh, statistics, statistics. And then we're going to ask, what is the answer? Then you're going to wake up, oh, oh we're going to do something. <laughs> yeah, and then we're going to have some time for reflections and, um, uh, and questions. So very quickly, so every summer we've been going to uh, Kenya to do some uh, stuff. This is Betty, and I can't remember her last name. She's, uh, uh, she's from here, you know, the um, uh, 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 Sheridan. Uh, she was with us in 2010. Uh, we're over there, you know, visiting a Maasai, uh, Maasai village. And... Uh, she did so well that they adopted her. Actually, 
So the Maasai, and I'm going to talk uh, a little bit about the Maasai, they tend to be uh, env environmentalist. Okay? Uh, they hang on to their animals, for example. Uh, they don't, they rarely kill their animals. They only kill them, they only slaughter them um, when there is great need. And so instead of slaughtering, what they do is they harvest, uh, uh, they harvest, uh, I don't want to be gross, but they harvest, you know, blood from, uh, uh, and mix it with um, uh, milk, you know, that's, that's how they get proteins instead of killing animals. So while we were there, uh, Betsy says, she want to experience that. I thought she was out of her mind. And the Maasai says, sure, we'll, we'll, we'll do it for you. So they brought in the cow, and uh, there was a bull, and then they did their thing, and we had the blood. And uh, so uh, here is Betsy. Uh, this cup uh, is a mug, has a mixture of blood, and uh, she drank it. And because of her courage, because of uh, that was a big deal, she was adopted into a Maasai woman. So she's a Maasai woman. 2010, that was a great experience. Then uh, 2013, uh, we identified this village that did not have water. Children were struggling. Uh, and 2013, we went back there and provided uh, a water well. And actually, Sheridan was involved in that project. We came over here to do a fundraiser. We got some funds from uh, Sheridan. We thank you for that. Uh, the children are well uh, in this particular village, the village of uh, Hillside. I took that picture. I could not, uh, uh, when the water came out, the children came from the woodwork. They brought their little bottles and everything. Uh, th this uh, uh, Caroline with the, the literature piece and whatnot, looking at this, there's a story to be told. Why would uh, this boy and the girl, the first thing they did before they drank, the first thing they did, they came on and they washed their face. We don't know what that means. I did not have a chance to talk with them, but I think they have a story to tell. The first thing they did was to uh, uh, wash their face. Um, 2014, we did uh, desks, uh, school desks for our school. I didn't show you the, uh, uh, the desk. This year, we're going to be going back there to, uh, this is a classroom. Okay? We identified a school. Uh, some students saw what they saw at uh, this classroom. We are going back there to rebuild um, uh, that classroom. Uh, people can come, students, members of the public, if you want to come, you're welcome to come. You saw my name, just, just talk with me, write me an email, and we'll put you to work. We're going to be there for a week, rebuilding that, uh, 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 that classroom. So that's a side show. All right, so the Maasai. Let's talk about who are the Maasai. Again, this is, uh, I always have to start here. Uh, this is uh, Africa. You can see it's a continent. And then, uh, <laughs> so we're going to be uh, just focusing on East Africa. This is East Africa because that's where uh, uh, the Maasai are. And this uh, uh, Charles Darwin thing, the whole Odvai Gorge, it's in, um, in Tanzania. That's where human remains, some of the uh, oldest human remains have been discovered. And that Odvai Gorge, that's where the Maasai, they move from uh, Serengeti all the way to Maasai Mara in northern Kenya. And sometimes they go all the way to Amboseri. Amboseri is on the base of um, uh, Mount Kilimanjaro. So that is their region. Um, so who are these Maasai? They're nomadic. Okay? They occupy a very dry region, of, uh, uh, a really dry region, arid region of uh, East Africa. And therefore, and they keep cows um, uh, and goats and, and sheep. So what they do is they move from place to place depending on, um, uh, on the weather. Uh, they tend to be um, uh, nomadic. In that region, they also have a lot of uh, wildlife. Again, that's where um, Serengeti is, that's where Maasai Mara is, and that's where Amboseri is. So they are interacting with wild animals, and some of the wild animals they interact with are lions. Okay? Now, I don't know how scientific this is. I know Matt is here with his science and whatnot, so you might want to talk to this. But we have asked, uh, while we are there, we have asked Maasai, why do you wear red uh, uh, pieces of cloth? All of them, they have something red. And they have argued that red scares animals, and especially lions. I don't know how true that is. All I know is I have seen it. I have been in a situation where there was an elephant, uh, not an elephant, but a lion. A Maasai showed up wearing red. And instead of the lion, they're vicious. Lions are, you know, they just want to eat something. Instead of uh, pouncing, they walk away. Um, I don't know whether it's uh, because they have been elected for a long, long time. They have learned to respect each other. I don't know. But to the Maasai, 
they say that uh, uh, the red that they wear uh, scares the, um, um, uh, the, um, uh, uh, the lions. They always have spears. And, and this is, the, to become a, a warrior, you know, the, the Maasai are warriors. They are warlike. Um, they, um, when the British, uh, Kenya was a British colony, and uh, when the British was trying to occupy uh, uh, Kenya, this was in uh, 1884, eh, 1800s, 1884, as they were trying to occupy, uh, to take over Kenya, that process was almost stopped by the Maasai because they came from uh, the east coast and in order for them to get to the central part of Kenya that looked like uh, Scotland, whatnot, you know, the highlands, that's what they wanted. But to get to the highlands, they have to go through the Maasai and the Maasai almost stopped that occupation. They are warlike, they are fierce, they are known for war. And the people who fight are these, they are called Molans. Okay? The strongest men um, uh, in the village, to become a Molan or to become a warrior, you kill, they, you have to kill, I'm saying they were supposed, they were killing a lion, a male lion. That was the light of passage. Now the government has kind of uh, interfered with that cultural process because they discovered that uh, uh, the lions, you know, people of tourism and whatnot, uh, the lions had uh, uh, value. Besides they were killing too many lions and there was fear that uh, hey, this practice might uh, end up uh, destroying uh, uh, the lions. So now the Maasai are not very rarely um, uh, do they kill lions. The only time they do it is uh, if the lions are destroying their animals, uh, if there's a conflict, and there's always, I know you're gonna be talking about uh, deer migration, there's always conflict between the Maasai and, um, and, and lions, and sometimes when lions kill their animals, uh, the Maasai will, uh, will kill uh, lions, but they don't do it anymore for, uh, for uh, uh, to, for, as a rite of passage. So, fierce people, look at them. Um, I wonder whether anybody who has ever seen interacted with the Maasai? So you know what I'm talking about? Really uh, tall and very, yeah. Yet, <laughs> those same people, their greetings, when they wake up in the morning, when they meet each other, their greetings are Kisarian in Gera. And how are the children? Whenever we visit them, this is what you see. This is uh, Jim Boucher. He's um, an eye doc um, a doctor in Alamy. Came with us. Um, we are visiting them. We are given a chance to interact with children. They want us to take care of the children first. They want us, um, uh, this is another group. This is my daughter, by the way. Uh, here's one of the participants who came with us. Look at the children, they are not far away. They are just close by because that's who they are. The focus is on the children. This is uh, the milk and the blood that I was talking about. We, you know, we did what we did and then uh, uh, we couldn't handle it anymore and the Malans came over and uh, they cleared the last. They were very happy to do that. These fierce people, their mindset is on the children and how are the children. And so as I was reflecting on this, I came across uh, 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 Leverett uh, uh, O'Neill's uh, 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 lighting on Kisari and Ingera. And he asks, I wonder what it would be like if the president of United States started his or her, oh, we don't have a, we haven't had a her, a she as a president, okay? So we're gonna stay with the H. I don't know why we don't have a she president. We haven't had a she president. We will. <laughs> Shame on us. <laughs> Liberia has, uh, uh, has had, uh, Liberia is a country in Africa, has had a female president. Malawi, another country in Africa, shame on us. Anyway, that's a presentation for another day. So, what would happen if uh, the president started the speech by asking, how are the children? How about the governor? If he started the, the, uh, uh, the speech, public event, whatever it is that the governor was doing, if they started it by asking, and how are the children? How about all of us? 
If we started off, when we wake up in the morning, our mindset are on our children. And how are the children? And some of you might say, I don't have children. I don't have to think about that. Oh yeah, other people's children are our children. But the only people who can have that mindset are the peacemakers. And peacemakers sacrifice self for the sake of what? Sacrifice self for the sake of others. So, because I'm a peacemaker, I wake up in the morning and I ask myself, how are our children today? Other people's children are my children. Because I do not exist alone. I'm a member of a human community. And when children are doing well, when the community is doing well, I'm doing well. And so Patrick asks, suppose that was the focus. Suppose that's how we started our day. I don't know about, uh, I don't know about uh, uh, Sheridan, but I have seen situations where children in Casper, they are trying to cross the road with their, their school bags. These little uh, uh, six-year-olds and uh, seven-year-olds, they are trying to cross the road to go to school, and drivers will not give them away. They will not stop so children can go to school. We have to hire a guard to stop the cars so children can go to school. That makes me angry. I ask myself, what happened to us? How are the children? Let's look at uh, how our children are. How are the children in the U.S.? How are our children? I just talked about the drivers, the relationship between drivers and uh, children. That's what I have seen. What do you think? How are the, our children? <laughs> Not pretty good. Tell us more. Give us some details. <laughs> what do you think? Well, how about the legislature not passing Medicaid expansion for all the little kids who can't get medical care? How are the children? And when they did not pass it, did we spend, how many people spend some sleepless night asking, how can that be? How many of us wrote an email? How many of us called somebody and said, how dare you? How dare you? Thank you, not pretty. Somebody else, how, how, what is your opinion? What are your experiences? What is the condition of our children? Tell us more. Going down the tube. Give us some. Um, from it's, it's done with adults in mind, not children in mind. It's centered on adults. No. Where is accountability? Where is the focus on, uh, on children? I had a teacher um, allow me to be a little bit um, uh, political here, negative, or whatever you want to see. I had a teacher come over to my office. She teaches uh, kindergartners. She came to my office, and um, I realized she was down was in the afternoon, I asked her, what's going on, Kim? She said, you cannot believe what's going on in my, in my classroom. Kindergartners, five-year-olds, they're testing all afternoon. And she said, there was one child who said, she's not going to test. She's not going to take that test. And that test, Kim, was affected mostly because that test, the performance in that test was going to mean something as far as the teacher was concerned. So where is the focus on the five-year-olds? Because of time issues, I want you to be thinking, what is the condition of, our ch uh, of uh, the status of our children? But, but I put out some uh, uh, statistics. This is where I'm going to put you to sleep, all the numbers. <laughs> All right. <laughs> this is what I got some data from the uh, Bureau of uh, National Statistics, Center for Disease Control, and why not? And, and we have about uh, 74 million children, 18 years and under, um, uh, in the U.S. So when I looked at that data, what I saw was uh, generally the conditions are favorable. About 55 percent, uh, they're doing well. It's favorable. But we have uh, another group about 46%, 45, 46% 46 
whose condition is not what we need to be seeing in our society. For example, last year, 16 million were on food stamps. And some of you may say, hey, hey, yeah, we are supporting the children. They were on food stamps. We gave them money. They, they ate something. And that's good. But that's not the issue. The issue is why? Why? And we don't have time to discuss that, but I, I, I just throw that at you. Why in the US, the greatest economy, the only superpower, how can we be in this situation? What's the issue? What's going on? But I dare mention that we need to start thinking about before we do what we call braming, braming games. Oh, it's uh, their parents. Oh, they don't work. It's, oh, it's them. It's, uh, it's them. It has nothing to do with me. It's them. Point fingers. I think it's better for us to be reminded of the fact that when I point a finger, I'm not shooting, I'm just pointing a finger. Uh, when I point a finger at you, how many fingers are pointing at me? How many? Three fingers. So we need to ask ourselves, what are these fingers? Yeah, it's their parents' fault. I get that. But how about these other fingers? What, do they, what, what are they telling us? We talk about the working poor. People who work hard, they're working two jobs, three jobs. And they're still not able to make ends meet. And when we talk about minimum wages, and I don't want to be political today. I know it's a Saturday. You know, we don't need to be political. But when we talk about, oh, let's look at living wages. How about availing living wages? We go, oh, no, 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 we can't do that. Supply and demand. Let the business take control of situation. Whoa, 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 whoa. Insanity. What is insanity? Doing it over and over and expecting what? If it's not working, is it tip than uh, our time to go, oh, wait a minute, let's rethink this. I'm just saying. <laughs> 16 million. Look at 15 million lived in poverty, which means they did not, they were not sure, their parents were not sure where the next meal is coming from. Some of them did not have those basic needs that Maslow talks about. Food, shelter, and clothing. Some of them clothing, they have hand-me-down. And so transportation, they did not have transportation. How can that be? One in, thir in 30 or 2.5 million. They were homeless in 2013. They did not have a home. Oh, and you might say, well, that's, uh, that's not my experience. That's somebody else's. I can tune off. Can we learn something from the Maasai maybe before we tune off? And how are the children? So when I see that statistic that uh, 2.5 million were homeless, 21.5 million received free and reduced meals. Before we go, ha ha, yeah, we give them uh, free my taxes at work. How about thinking about how can we address this situation so that instead of giving, now this group becomes contributors to the taxes. How about thinking outside the box? How about thinking in a deeper way? Instead of just saying, well, my job is to pay taxes. That's it, I'm done. And how are the children? I said I'm not going to be political, but we need to be thinking about this. Nothing against um, um, a single parent. Uh, people become, most people become single parents, not by choice, but because of circumstances beyond their control. But studies have shown us that this situation impact children. Obesity has something to do, we need to think about that. 
one in three were obese. And that has um, uh, implication. 20% said they're experiencing very challenging situations when they are at school. They don't feel safe. Actually, actually, it's not feeling. They know they are not safe because they have been bullied, either physically or emotionally. 20%. But good news, now that I have depressed you. Good news. Notwithstanding, our graduation rate, high school graduation rate is at six, uh, 86%. We're doing well, but we still have 14% that are dropping out. We cannot. We cannot fail, not even one. We need to bring those statistics to 99.999%. And so the question is, how are we going to do that? Could it be that we need to ask ourselves, and how are the children? And how are the children? And we are not asking that question as an abstract question. We are asking that question as a concrete question where we are immersed in it and asking ourselves, what can I do? And how are the children? What can I do? That's maybe the lesson out of this. Hey, so that's national statistics. Wyoming, how are we doing? Any different? No, but much, much better. In Wyoming, we are doing um, our statistics shows that, um, well, we are doing well. And I, I just showed uh, some uh, for example, teacher pay, generally speaking, um, much, much better. Um, spending per pupil, um, um, it's very, very high. Um, uh, uh, teacher pupil uh, relationship um, 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 ratio, um, 12, you know, and this is generally, uh, generally speaking. So, but we still have issues, we still have work to do, right? So, given this situation, in 2009, I'm a graduate of uh, Leadership Wyoming. You know what Leadership Wyoming is? Mm -hmm. Cool, yeah, I'm a graduate of Leadership Wyoming. So in 2009, um, part of that pro uh, project, you know, that program, is that participants, they do a project. You know, it takes about a year, you do a project. Uh, we're divided up into groups, and my team, what, 10? Are you kidding me? <laughs> My team decided to look at this issue and how are the children in Wyoming? So what we did is uh, we decided we're gonna, we're gonna ask teachers, we're gonna talk to teachers. We're gonna ask them how are the children? And so the criteria was one of the, our part, my partners came from uh, Jackson. I had a partner from uh, myself Riverton, and then there was a partner from uh, Cheyenne. We decided uh, we're going to talk to teachers who have been teaching for the last 20 years. We're going to ask them, how are the children? What have you seen? What's going on with our children? So these teachers, we ask them, uh, give us, look back. What are your experiences? What have you seen? This is uh, one of the participants, and he's the only one who allowed us to use uh, uh, his picture. They came back and gave us a lot of uh, feedback. Um, and so we had uh, all these you know, uh, themes that they gave us. Today I just want to focus on one theme, which is increased in discipline in our schools. They said, looking back from when they started 20 years ago, all of them without fail, they identified discipline problems. For example, this teacher said, I encounter students who really have a difficult time dealing with anger, authority, and respect. Children are always fighting. And so for him, he said he's holding a guitar. When fights break, break out, when things are getting out of control, he goes back to his guitar. That's how he calms the students. Question is, how did we get to that point? Let me move on because I'm told I only have a few minutes. This teacher did not give us uh, a name, so I have a permission to use her picture, so I used uh, something from online. She said, I have to say that students are far less connected to school and community than they were when I started to teach. 
This has a strong negative impact on the school climate. Children do not have a sense of belonging. They just want to come in and out. They don't belong there. How can that be? <coughs> this one said, uh, uh, again, she didn't give, he didn't give us permission to use his picture, so I'm using something from online. He said, children are coming, they are anxious. They are anxious. And he said, they are under great pressure to succeed. There's something going on. They're not able to focus because they are anxious. Also said, children are becoming very aggressive. Perhaps because they don't connect, because there's something else that is going on. Children are becoming very aggressive. This teacher says, children are becoming, again, aggressive, not only towards others, but towards me. This particular teacher, when we were discussing, I'm the one who interviewed this one, she broke down into tears. She want to do the best. She want to help the children, but she doesn't know how. This other one says, I have children who come in and, and refuse to talk to her. They refuse to talk, and there's nothing you can do about it. So we ask them, uh, what, what, what's causing this? What, what, in your opinion, what is the cause? They talked about parental, lack of parental involvement. And actually, we see this. We can track this down to the, um, uh, the hippie movement. I don't want, don't want to be critical to that sort of research. They can track it down to the 60s. That's when we are seeing a change in parental uh, uh, styles, breakup of the family. And they talked about the children seems not to respect self. They don't respect others. And they don't respect authority. Why? How are the children? These elements are taught somewhere. And we start teaching respect for self, respect for others, and respect for community. We do it at home. I wish I had time I would talk about animals, what I have seen with animals when we go on safari. You see animals that don't think teaching structure and order to their children so that when their children grow up, they already have internalized those elements. You need to watch elephants. You need to watch baboons interact with their, with their children. Am I saying we need to spank them like baboons do? That's not what I'm talking about. Oh, so, so then we ask them, okay, fine, we know what the problem is. What are we going to do? Almost without fail, these teachers said, it's mine. I'm going to take care of this. And how are the children? They said, we refuse. I refuse to focus on the problem. Yes, I know what the problem is, but I'm going to focus on solution. They said, I'm going to do it. Suppose all of us said that. We interact with children on a daily basis. Suppose instead of talking about, oh, did you see how disrespectful that child is? Suppose we changed the mindset and started talking about, oh, let me, I want to know something about yourself. Uh, my name is, um, just introduce yourself, have a conversation with them, and somehow create moments where we can teach kindness and respect. Oh, we can't do that. We're going to be sued. I know that. Can't we begin a conversation about this lawsuit and everything and begin to talk about, hey, we are a community. They said, oh, we need, I already talked about this. We need uh, parental and community involvement. This is where we talk about the I. Let's not talk about you. You, you talk about me, what am I going to do? If you did something, I'm not saying you don't do something, I'm just giving an example. If you did something, the other person did something, without even communicating, somehow we're just going to see things changing. Because a journey of a thousand miles starts with a what? With a single step. Is it Gandhi who said, uh, be the change that you want? We don't talk about, hey, why don't you do something? I talk about, why don't I do something? I'm going to be the change that I want. So they talked about, uh, it takes a village. See, 
You say that you don't talk about Tikka Village, Paul. There it is. This is the Tikka Village. They brought it back. Okay? More parental involvement. They said, uh, yeah, they understand that parents have to, to work. Remember peacemakers? They talked about, uh, we need to start thinking about uh, why are we working? Are we working so that we can amass all the toys that we can get? Because television has told me that uh, the more toys I have, the happier I'm going to be. Is that why I'm doing it? If that's why I'm doing it, maybe drop one job so I can focus on the children. If I'm working several jobs because I am not able to, uh, to make ends meet, maybe we need to have a bigger, a larger conversation as a community and say that nobody should be able to put eight hours of work and not be able to uh, uh, meet their needs. How come you're not giving me a hand when I share something like that? Give me a hand. Come on, people. Go ahead. <laughs> Minimum wages. Come on, people. Let's look at that. I almost thought about uh, Obama, State of the Union, saying, that's good stuff, people. That's what I wanted to say. <laughs> they said, uh, oh, this TV thing, folks, technology, internet, whatnot, we need to do something about it. Children see it. They think that's real. These teachers said, really, we need to, we need to rethink that and increase the, um, our, our community. So the question is, in order for us to think about and to help our children, could it be that this Maasai thinking, this Maasai ideology of, and how are the children, could be our answer? And so if that could be the answer, the question is, Imagine what would happen if the governor, if you, if me, if everybody started the day, and you don't even have to ask, have it, have it in our mind. And how are the children? I love interacting with other people's children. And how are the children? When is the last time we said hi to other people's children? Hey, I, how are you? That's great. <laughs> Could it be that that's the answer? Paul has stood up, he's asking me to shut up. <laughs> and I'm gonna stop it there now. So. Thank you very much.